Welcome back. Now we're going to talk about some of those accessory organs of the skin. And so the main ones we'll talk about are your um, sebaceous and sweat glands, your hair, and your nails. Okay. So when you look here, you can see um, different types of sweat glands or different sweat glands. Um, here's one. There's another one. These are called eCrin sweat glands. Um, another name for a sweat gland, just so you know, is a sudoriferous gland. Um, they really sweat to, um, well, different types of sweat glands. These eCrin's ones really sweat to the surface of the skin to cool us off. We also have these sebaceous glands, which are located within a hair follicle. And um, so the sebaceous glands produce oils. What oils do is they help to waterproof skin and help to keep the hair from being too brittle. You don't see nail on here. Apologies. So let's look at sebaceous glands or oil glands. These are located all over the skin wherever we have hair. And this is because sebaceous glands release oil or sebum into the hair follicle. And so what it does is it protects the skin, prevents your hair from becoming too brittle, and it can also kill bacteria. So this is a photomicrograph of sebaceous glands releasing into hair follicles. Then we have sweat glands. There are two types or sudoriferous glands. There are two major types, eCrin and apocrine. The ones that you saw in that figure were eCrin glands. eCrin sweat glands are the sweat glands that are associated with um, sweat when you are hot. And so these start functioning at birth so that you can produce a sweat that keeps your body from getting too hot. Um, in that sweat is predominantly water, but then there are certain types of ions as well as some waste products. The waste products actually help to make the sweat slightly acidic, which provides an acid mantle on the surface of the skin protecting us from pathogens as well. And so again, here are your eCrim sweat glands. Apocrine sweat glands don't start working until puberty and they release a sweat that is more milky in substance. It's a thicker milky sweat um, in the axillary and pubic regions. And so this type of sweat is also what we typically call stress sweat. Um, so when you're really stressed out and your underarms start to sweat, you feel uncomfortable. Um, this is also the sweat that is considered stinky. So if you've ever noticed, babies, even when they're sweaty, don't tend to have a stinky smell. I mean, they can if they have a dirty diaper, but you know what I'm talking about. But once you hit puberty, that's when you start producing that smell. Well, it's not actually the sweat itself that stinks. It's the bacteria on the surface of the skin that are eating, metabolizing that sweat that produce the smell. So as they break down the sweat, it starts to stink. So these, um, or this sweat is more, so it's major function. I mean, well, it's produced when you're stressed out. That's not a really good function, though. It does contain some chemicals called pheromones. Pheromones are chemicals that are um, that function in attracting individuals, so finding a mate. That's the major job of pheromones. Um, we tend to have other mechanisms. We don't tend to use pheromones. It's not just chemical stimuli that make us attracted to our mates. Um, there's a lot of other things that go into it, but 
in the animal kingdom, pheromones are huge. And, you know, different animals that produce more pheromones may be more attractive to the females. Then we have hair. Hair is produced um, in hair follicles. And the root of the hair is the only part of the hair. So you can see the hair bulb and the root is the only part of the hair that's actually living. So right down here is where hair starts forming. As it moves away from this hair bulb and the hair root, the um, keratin keratinized cells die. And that's why it doesn't hurt when you have a haircut. Um, the melanocytes within the, the hair bulb are what provide the coloration of our hair. So this is a photomicrograph of hair. It's kind of cool. Um, hair looks really cool when it's under a microscope, whereas hair naturally just looks kind of flat. Hold on a second. So the hair follicle is composed of epithelial um, tissues, or epithelial cells, sorry. Um, in the dermal region, we have a blood supply that, that goes to the hair bulb, which is where the cells are alive and they are reproducing, which is what causes hair growth. The erector pili muscle, which you saw on the other slide, is a smooth muscle that controls those hairs um, and allow those hairs to stand upright when we get very cold or when we're frightened. So on humans, it's not going to be a huge thing, but you've probably seen um, like goosebumps or where your hair starts standing up when you either get scared or you get cold. But a better example of this is when you look at your dog or your cat. I, I would say dog mainly. Have you ever seen a dog when they get really, really, really stressed out? Their hair stands up or when they're playing and they want to look more ferocious, their hair stands up on the back of their body. That is what the erector pili muscles do. It makes them look more ferocious, bigger, so that they maybe could um, chase off a predator. So think of it that way. Um, and associated with our evolution, these erector pili muscles probably had a lot more importance when we were um, trying to stay alive when there were a lot of other animals trying to kill us. And so this is that living region. Um, you don't see their erector pili muscle, but this is where the blood vessels will come in and nourish within this hair bulb. And then the cells will grow out. And as they grow out, they become more and more keratinized and eventually they will be um, dead cells. Nails then are the last appendage that we'll talk about or last accessory organ. These are also um, keratinized squamous epithelium. These are basically a modified form of skin. They're just super, super, super thick. Um, nails don't have pigment. They don't have the melanocytes producing pigment. And their major function is for protection on the hands and on the feet. But then they have a second function in helping us to grasp and tear things apart. So there are parts to a nail. There's a region of the nail called the free edge, which is what we typically cut off as it gets longer. There's the body. That's the part that's attached to underlying um, skin and connective tissue. The nail folds are the regions that fold into the edge of our skin. Um, and then we have the root, which is embedded. So you never see the root. So here you can see the free edge. You see the nail body. So all of this nail here is actually dead. The only area of the nail that's alive is way down here at this nail matrix where we actually are producing new nail. So as nail is being produced here, it dies as it moves 
further up to the surface or to the edge of our finger, okay, or toe. Um, all of this nail is dead tissue. But if you have, if your nail is peeled off, so, I mean, you probably had a period where something bent your nail back, that hurts because this tissue here is living and it's connected to the nail. So when you bend your nail, it actually pulls that tissue and that can hurt a lot. So this next picture, this is just a, well, it's, it's a joke, but not really. I mean, you've all seen ingrown toenails. So here's an example of a huge, ugly ingrown toenail. Um, this ingrown toenail is kind of like what my husband had at one time. He had an ingrown toenail this bad, but it was on both sides. So it was like super creepy. Um, what they do when you have an ingrown toenail is depending on the, the severity is they're going to numb your toe up and then they're going to cut the edges all the way down to that nail matrix. They kill the nail at the nail matrix in those areas, and then the nail never grows back in that area. So with my husband, since it was super, super um, embedded on both sides like this, he basically had like a little curly cue. They cut the entire nail off, cut the entire thing, and they killed the entire nail because we now, um, one of the major reasons we have nails on our toes is for protection, but we now wear shoes that are more protective than our nails ever have been. So um, he actually has one toe that has no nail on it and it'll never grow back. It's really cool. So that's where this cartoon comes in. I, I just love it. It makes me laugh. Um, which way do I go? Here's the nail. And this guy says, go straight forward this way. And he said, oh, in here? No, this way. This doesn't make sense. Are you sure that I'm going in the right way? So here's, he's growing inwards and in making an ingrown toenail, which are very painful. If you've ever had one, you know. Um, if you've never had an ingrown toenail, thank your parents because um, these actually are genetically related. So there are different reasons that you can have an ingrown toenail. One of them is due to weight. If you have a lot of ex excess weight on the body, like say you get pregnant, um, and you gain a lot of weight during that pregnancy that can lead you to get an ingrown nail which happened to me but another is your genetics so i have two children who have had ingrown toenails multiple times both of them and it's due to uh, their genetics so their father also gets ingrown toenails all the time i find them fascinating i'm going to stop this video here it's been almost 13 minutes so i'll see you in the next one bye